Okay. Um, good evening, everybody. Can everybody hear me? Thank you very much for coming. Um, my name is Ben Kemp. I'm general counsel at the Institute and faculty. Thank you um, to everybody for being here. Thank you in particular to Mark Sansom and Martin McKelvey from Freshfields, and indeed to Freshfields for hosting um, this uh, session this evening. I don't suppose Freshfields need any introduction as um, leading, uh, 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 leading law firm, uh, not least in the area of competition law. And we're delighted and, um, and grateful to them for um, putting on this session. A number of our members ask us very frequently for guidance, support in different areas relevant to their volunteer roles with the institution faculty, work they undertake for us. Um, and this, is, uh, this session is a direct response to questions we've had in relation to the area of competition law. Perhaps not to some of us the most... Hi. Uh, perhaps not to some of us the uh, most obvious issue um, that might, you might come across. Um, in, in acting, uh, in undertaking your roles for your professional body, but actually case, recent case law um, and indeed a indeed, um, number of uh, recent investigations um, and development of the law in different ways has demonstrates that it is very relevant to us. It's important, it's important area for us to be aware of. Um, and uh, Mark and Martin are going to bring that to life, illustrate um, how, it, and it, how it is relevant and exactly what the implications might be for us and what we should um, be uh, aware of. Uh, the session is going to be filmed, I think. Is that right, Ilna? Yes. It is. Um, and that for the purpose of allowing this uh, session to be uh, spread and put on the internet, um, uh, allow others to uh, access it later. So please do invite your colleagues to do just that following the session. Um, the intention, I believe, is to have a... Uh, an hour or so of initial presentation. Um, Mark and Martin, very happy to take your points of clarification, immediate points that occur to you as they go. More discursive questions, issues, if you wish to raise those at the end, there's going to be an opportunity for further half hour or so of discussion afterwards as well. Um, without further ado, enough of me. Thank you very much. Well, good evening, everybody. A very warm welcome to Freshfields. We're very pleased to be hosting this event under the auspices of the Institute and Faculty of Actuaries. Um, thank you for that introduction. I think this is uh, a very topical subject and something which uh, it is important for everyone to bear in mind uh, in the course of their activities under the auspices of the IFOA. Um, we will uh, indeed speak for about an hour. Uh, do please chip in with thoughts as we go through. Uh, in particular, what we try to do is bring some of this to life uh, with some case studies. Uh, so when we get to those scenarios, that might be uh, a particularly appropriate time. If you have thoughts on similar real-world situations, please do feel free to raise them. Uh, and uh, as Ben said, we've left some time at the end for a, a good old, hopefully very interactive uh, Q&A session. Uh, and the more interactive it can be, uh, the, the better as far as we're concerned. So please do use that opportunity. Uh, we've also uh, got uh, more drinks and canapes afterwards. Uh, so a chance to network, uh, hopefully in a competition-compliant way. Um, you'll find the smoke-filled rooms just beyond the cloak rooms down there, but please don't use those. Um, so uh, let's uh, get going. Um, broadly, this is what we're proposing to cover today. Um, I will run through the first couple of areas, which is just to try and uh, get across why competition law applies um, to the activities in which you engage under uh, the IFOA, uh, and also really just set out a little bit of law, essentially, um, on uh, where you can get into trouble, in particular with agreements between members that may be construed as being anti-competitive, uh, and I think what will probably be the really hot topic, which is information exchange. You know, that is the classic uh, potential issue that arises um, in these sorts of uh, professional organizations and trade associations, and so we'll talk quite a lot about um, the law and guidance in that area. Uh, Martin will then amplify uh, all of that, including through some case studies, and will also come on uh, to try and give you some guidance and general principles, which will hopefully be of use to you as you then uh, take this forward and uh, engage in your uh, activities. So um, we're not, I should say, trying to turn people into barrack room lawyers. Uh, or pretending that in the course of an hour and a bit of discussion you'll somehow feel uh, that you're experts. Um, competition law is a very judgmental area. Uh, it's also quite an uh, a economically dependent and case-specific area. 
uh, there's a big difference, as we'll see, between exchanging information uh, between actors in a market which is a very tight oligopoly and exchange of information uh, in a much more diffuse market with a lot of players, for example. And so sometimes uh, the answers are quite case specific. We'll do our best to give you uh, the principles and to guide you. Um, but if we appear to be evasive on any particular scenarios, that'll be why. Um, the important point for tonight is that we hope to leave you with a sense of the alarm bells that should ring. Um, so if nothing else, you know to pick up the phone and uh, perhaps provoke a more detailed discussion about whether something that's being proposed is, is indeed appropriate. Um, so why are we talking about competition law? Well, there's a number of reasons. Um, first, competition authorities, more so with trade associations than professional bodies, have had quite a long-standing distrust of the potential for those fora to be uh, used either deliberately or just unintentionally by mission creep um, as um, a forum for anti-competitive information exchanges. And you see that in quite a sort of number of cases over the years. Um, decisions by trade associations and professional bodies are also themselves capable of infringing competition law because they're seen as collective decisions by uh, independent undertakings. Um, competition authorities are also increasingly interested in the information exchange area. Um, they've almost moved beyond, certainly in slightly more mature competition enforcement jurisdictions, which includes the UK, beyond you know, just focusing on classic smoke-filled room cartels. There still are some of those, um, and they do those cases, but there's a lot more thought leadership going on now about information exchange and the circumstances in which that can be harmful to competition and therefore to consumers in the end. Uh, and so this sort of stuff is quite high up the list of priorities of the Office of Fair Trading in this country, uh, soon to be replaced by the Competition and Markets Authority next year. It will be a priority for them as well. And on top of that, we now have the Financial Conduct Authority, um, relevant, of course, to many of you in the industries in which you work. And they have competition laced throughout their powers. It's one of their three central pillars that they have to have regard to um, competition and the benefits to consumers in all that they do. Uh, and it therefore bleeds into their exercise of all of their powers across the financial services sector. So that is um, a very big and recent extension of competition law uh, and will, you know, we think, uh, increase quite dramatically the extent to which uh, regulated companies who fall within the purview of the FCA will have to have regard to these issues. We're already seeing it. Um, you know, you don't have to look very far to see a lot of examples of concern about information exchange issues in the financial services conduct, context, whether that's LIBOR or PLATS or you know, any number of other uh, ongoing investigations. Um, we just put up on the slide here some recent um, uh, examples, along with a couple of older ones, of um, the sort of thing we're talking about. So the, uh, the very glamorously titled UK Asbestos Training Association um, got into trouble uh, some, uh, some months ago for uh, having um, uh, a practice which was effectively requiring their members or suggesting strongly to their members that they charge similar prices. Uh, presented as recommended prices, but in a way that appeared to, to run the risk of alignment of prices. So they were investigated by the OFT, managed to get themselves out of it by uh, giving undertakings uh, that they would um, not do that, and they would ensure that their members competed against each other on price as they should do. Uh, the Portuguese case, uh, I know is one that's crossed um, some of your uh, radars. Um, very interesting case. This is the Portuguese Association of Chartered Accountants, uh, which got into trouble uh, initially in Portugal, ended up going up to the European Court, uh, the European Court of Justice on a, a reference. Uh, and what they had done is they had provided through a regulation for a mandatory system of credit-based training for people who wanted to qualify as chartered accountants in Portugal. Uh, the problem was that they had reserved to themselves the right to provide a third of that training, as well as the ability to sanction or not alternative training providers. So you can see that that uh, decision by that professional body in Portugal had the effect of distorting the market for the provision of training and qualification services to would-be chartered accountants. 
Um, that uh, they got fined for it in Portugal. There are references up to the European Court of Justice, uh, which confirmed that this, you know, this regulation that the professional body had passed was capable of being a decision by an association of undertaking is something which could infringe competition law. Uh, the Italian case, third one down, is just an example of trade associations getting caught up in cartel activity. So um, uh, this was a shipping cartel. Uh, I think 16 um, shipping companies got fined, along with two trade associations which had uh, facilitated the operation of the cartel. Uh, and there are quite a few cases, if you look back in the annals of, of competition law, where trade associations either themselves uh, or professional organizations themselves um, have colluded in what has become effectively cartel behavior, price fixing, market sharing, customer allocation. Or at the very least, they have provided the forum on the margins of which these discussions have happened. And so that's why there is this sort of slight inherent um, suspicion. Good example is the, um, the laundry powder cartel. Um, these things are never ter terribly glamorous. It's, I think the economic reason is that the, uh, the products that tend to get cartelized are the ones that are homogeneous, and so it's difficult to compete on anything other than price. So there's little room for sort of added value propositions. Um, so in the laundry powder cartel, um, the three largest European manufacturers of, uh, of laundry powder had colluded um, uh, in a way that effectively fixed prices across 80 EU member states. And they'd done that, again, by using a trade association and under the guise of some common standards that were intended to go to um, environmental uh, performance of their products, they actually managed to align prices. Um, and there have been cases in this country too, uh, older cases, the 2004 one uh, relating to the ABI uh, was uh, hire cars, wasn't it, Martin? So yes. replacement vehicles. Replacement so vehicles and uh, a, a good-natured scheme, which eventually did get approved, uh, albeit with conditions by the Office of Fair Trading, with, with a, a good purpose behind it to try and save on the costs of credit hire. Uh, and as we'll explain in a moment, that, that's still very much uh, in issue at the moment. Yeah. Um, and the even older case, General Insurance Standards Council, that was a, um, uh, a rule of the GISC which required members um, to um, only deal with intermediaries who were themselves members of the GISC. And that was found to be some of the restrictive competition. So there certainly is previous, if you like, uh, in relation to some of the sectors in which um, you as members would work. Um, a few other cases. My stock in trade is a, a cartel lawyer, really, uh, and abuse of dominance cases and follow-on litigation. Um, the person among the two of us with the real industry expertise here is Martin, um, who spent a lot of his competition law career working in uh, auditing, accounting, financial services, banking, uh, state aid, um, uh, insurance, and so on. So um, I think these cases, Martin, I think you've been involved in all of them. These are, yeah, these are four ongoing market studies or market investigations uh, with the competition authorities in the UK at the moment. Uh, I have the joy of working on all four of them. Um, I'm going to pick out two in particular. These are not, as Mark said, cartel cases. They aren't about smoke-filled rooms. They aren't the sort of cases that end up in high-profile fines they're using different powers that the competition authorities possess just to look at markets and say, do we think that these are working well? Why is it relevant for today? It's relevant because those investigations allow the authorities to go deep, deep into how the market works, how firms engage with one another, how they compete with one another, or sometimes how they don't compete with one another. A good example is the first one on the list there, the investigation into statutory audit uh, now sort of coming to an end uh, but one of the allegations that was made quite vocally at an early stage of that was that the big four auditors were whether tacitly or less tacitly colluding with one another on price or on other aspects of their service there were too many contact points between big four auditors often again with very good intentions but in ways that meant that their services were altogether a little too similar to one another. Now, that has gone nowhere in the context of this investigation, which is a good thing for our clients, but it is the sort of allegation that's very easily made. And when it's made in the context, say, of a Marx investigation like this, it does make the authorities prick up their ears and think, ah, is there something to this? Is there cartelized behavior sitting behind this? 
The other one I might just mention is the uh, motor insurance market investigation, uh, ongoing very much in the thick of it at the moment, and very much at the heart of it is the JTEA that Mark mentioned, uh, the ABI agreement that dates back to the, to the early 2000s, still thinking hard now about whether that is an appropriate and effective means for uh, insurers to be collaborating and agreeing with one another Oh, and quite an important component of their offering, what the, what the replacement vehicle that their, uh, their insured parties get and whether that's effective and proper. So still an issue more than 12 years after that was put in place. So all of these types of investigation, even if they're not themselves about cartels, really focus the attention of the authorities on the sorts of industries that all of us in this room are working in. Good. So this is my um, unapologetic scaremongering slide. Um, I think it is important to bear in mind the things that can happen uh, if everything goes wrong in terms of competition compliance. Uh, I'm sure most of you will be aware that the, the headline fining point is the possibility of fines up to 10% of worldwide turnover in the previous business year. Um, and those fines could be uh, levied on the IFOA, uh, also on its members. Uh, and there are complicated rules about fines being levied on the FIOA. If it were unable to pay, it could call uh, to its members to do so, and the Commission, European Commission, could actually force it to do that. Um, so very eye-watering fines uh, can result. And you'll probably be aware, just from some of the cases outside the financial services sector, but you know, the fines these days can reach hundreds of millions of euros, um, in some cases even cumulatively billions. Uh, so in the powder detergent case on the previous slide, uh, I think the combined fines there, just on two of the three companies, uh, were upwards of 350 million euros. The third company blew the whistle under the, the famous whistleblower leniency and immunity regime, was the first in through the regulator's door with the information to hang its co-conspirators, if you like, and therefore receive full immunity from fines. And that is itself an important dynamic to be aware of in this context, because if you f ever were to find yourself, heaven forbid, in a situation where uh, things had gone too far in the context of a committee meeting or project, um, there is a real risk that if someone gets back to their office and has an oops moment and realizes they better talk to their general counsel, that you might get people racing into the regulator um, to um, effectively turn Queen's evidence uh, and, uh, and leave the others bearing the totality of any fine. Um, so if you do have concerns in this area, it's important to raise them rapidly, um, just frankly for the benefit of your own uh, organizations uh, and the IFOA as much as anyone else. Um, there's also increased criminality in this area. Uh, one of the things that's recently happened as part of this quite big suite of changes to the UK competition regime is that the bar to a criminal conviction for people who engage in infringing um, cartel behavior has been lowered. Until April this year, there used to be a requirement of dishonesty. Uh, so to get a conviction home, the Serious Fraud Office and all the, the, uh, the, the OFT would have to prove that the person who'd engaged in uh, the market sharing, the bid rigging, the cartel price fixing, uh, knew it was wrong and bad, essentially. They had to have subjectively known it was bad, and it needs to have been objectively bad by the standards of ordinary, decent people on the Clapham Omnibus and all these crazy legal tests that you, you get in these situations. Um, that was quite a hard bar for them to clear, um, so they've got rid of it uh, in the way that government tends to do. Uh, so there's now no requirement of dishonesty. There's no mental element to the offense. If you engage in uh, reciprocal, um, restrictive behavior with people operating at the same level of the market as you, i.e. your competitors, you are potentially at risk of falling within the new, wider cartel offense. And that is a big deal, um, because there can be up to five years in prison for that. People who are company's house directors can be struck off. Um, obviously, a possibility of fines as well. We're in a period of great uncertainty about how the new regime is going to be interpreted. Uh, the legislation is frankly poor. It's a very broad offense. There are some defenses which are deeply confusing including the fact that you've consulted a lawyer about what you're doing, which apparently provides a defense regardless of whether or not you listened to the lawyer or just went ahead and did it anyway, which can't be right, um, but it's an obvious loophole that's been pointed out to them and missed. Uh, strange defenses about 
whether you published things in advance so no one can say you were trying to hide it from your customers or from the regulators. All remains to be seen how that will be interpreted. Guidance due this autumn, um, but just appropriate to be careful. Damages claims, um, big area um, for me. I spend a lot of my professional life these days dealing with follow-on damage litigation where there's been cartel behavior, anti-competitive information exchanging, people who think they've been harmed by that suing. Um, the amounts of money claimed in those cases are very often larger than the fines meted out by the regulators. Um, very big exposure. And of course, just the mere fact of having to go through an investigation is immensely onerous. They take a long time, typically at least a year, often two, three, four, five years, um, really absorb a lot of cost and management time, big distraction, and obviously there's a reputational hit as well once investigations reach the stage of information being put in the public domain. So lots of good reasons to um, uh, take great care. On this slide, we just um, put up something from one of the OFT's public guidance documents, which we thought captured things quite nicely. Um, the basic point is for those who engage in um, these sorts of meetings and working groups involving competitors, uh, it is very important to be trained, the reason we're all here today, and to have a sense of how far you can legitimately go in discussions and where you need to stop. Um, so with that in mind, um, I'll stop scaremongering and start to tell you a little bit about what the rules are, then we'll come on to the case studies, and then we'll provide the guidance. I won't do this in any detail, because I think it's better illustrated actually through the examples, but what we're talking about here is in the EU a thing called um, Article 101 of the EU Treaty, um, and there's a UK equivalent to that, which is helpfully called Chapter 1, so nice and easy to remember. Uh, and if you're a real um, students these things. In America, it is Section 1 of the Sherman Act, so basically very similar rules, so all the ones. Uh, and those bite on anti-competitive agreements and arrangements, essentially, including decisions by trade associations and professional bodies that represent their members, uh, and including not just um, uh, written agreements, but as we'll see, uh, looser type arrangements as well, general concerted behavior. Uh, we also have, although it's less relevant for today, provisions dealing with abuse of dominant market positions. So if you think of a lot of the monopolization, dominance cases over the years, emblematic cases such as Microsoft or Intel, uh, B Sky B famously investigated a number of times. Um, those are the sorts of cases where companies have a strong degree of market power that they are abusing um, through various pricing or other exclusionary practices. Um, we're really focusing for today on the restrictive agreement bit because that's the bit that bites on information exchanges. Uh, and we mustn't forget as well as the Office of Fair Trading uh, seems to be the CMA in this country, the European Commission, which enforces cases which have an impact on trade between member states. We mustn't lose sight of the FCA, as we've mentioned. Mark, are we able to interrupt you? Please, yeah. Um, I'm just trying to get the context of this in connection with the profession. Yeah. Because you've given a lot of examples which seem to be all around kind of collusion and price fixing and acting as a cartel. Mm -hmm. And I can see why someone like the ABI, which is a trade body, is in that sort of murky area. You know, we're a profession, we're not a trade body. Mm -hmm. And so I'm kind of thinking of all these examples that you've given and I'm kind of thinking, well, no, no, no. And, and I'm, I'm kind of lingering in the back of my mind, well, maybe there's something in this information sharing and I'm kind of thinking, well, actually, maybe the, the more injured part is likely to be my employer rather than, the, 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 than some consumer. Um, mm -hmm. And so I, I'm, I'm worried about that, but then I'm thinking, well, maybe that's not competition law, that's just kind of some other. Well, I think that the intention is both are risks. If there are working parties we know under the auspices of the IFOA where you know, folks will get together to carry out a research project, whatever it may be. And it's really, as you rightly say, the information exchange implications of that, uh, where the concerns arise in that context. And that's because to a competition enforcer, these information exchanges are often either regarded as amounting to cartel behavior, because they lead to what they would see as price fixing, or mm -hmm. customer sharing, or other consequences, or they fall short of cartel behavior, but still fall within the Article 101 
Chapter 1 prohibition on restrictive agreements. So those things per se can be objected to by the regulators. So just to, to articulate that I've understood it correctly, so to the extent that we have a working party about what is the best practice for with profit funds and we all share in our pooled experiences yep. and come up with a blueprint as to what is good, you know, what is good behaviour within with profit funds and, and, and benefit. That could be yeah. potentially a suspicious. And we'll come on to this, but it's, yeah, there are particular things that they would concern them. Um, the sort of one sentence version would be things that risk aligning what should be uh, areas in which you compete against your rivals. So if it has the result of aligning your prices or aligning your, um, your commercial approach to certain terms and conditions or other parameters of competition between you know, your employer and you know, the other people in the room, that would be the concern. But it's irrelevant that I might damage my employer's competitive position by blurting some sort of... Yeah, uh, we'll see in a minute. The law is very harsh on this, um, so it was, we'll come on to discuss. You know, one-off information exchanges have been found to infringe. Um, unilateral information exchanges have been found to infringe if the quality of the information that's passed over is such as to give rise to the damage. But we'll try and provide a bit more um, detail on that. Um, so what sort of behavior will potentially be problematical? Um, well, I mentioned before, there's no need for formal agreements. So competition law doesn't care whether the agreement is written down necessarily or whether it's just an oral exchange. The only difference is one of proving it. Um, but there are plenty of cases where cartels or uh, Information exchanges have happened on the margins of an industry gathering where it's been purely verbal, um, nothing documented. And there's a, a concept of concerted practice which captures all these things that fall short of express agreements, including you know, nod and a wink type arrangements where people know the value and the implications of what they're doing but don't go as far as expressly agreeing it or writing anything down. Um, so all those things are equally caught. Um, mentioned unilateral one-off disclosures. I mean, perhaps best to illustrate it through some examples. So um, the RBS Barclays case, I don't know whether any of you are familiar with that, uh, a year or two ago in this country, uh, RBS fined £28.5 million. Pounds. Um, and what had happened there was individuals in RBS's professional uh, practices coverage team had unilaterally disclosed uh, information concerning their terms of loans to large professional services firms, actually, to some of their colleagues at Barclays. Um, and Barclays had taken account of that information in then setting its own um, terms and pricing to um, that group of customers as well. Uh, Barclays applied for immunity. RBS got the whole of the fine. Um, and that was, again, because of the nature of the information and the fact it had had an impact on the market. It had had an effect on Barclays' prices. Um, One-off exchanges... Uh, a case in the Netherlands a few years ago, T-Mobile, uh, one-off exchange was found to have infringed as well. So, question. Okay. In that Barclays RBS case, would it have been the same consideration if an employee had moved from one employer to another, taking within the knowledge of those terms and conditions? Or would, would there be a defence in that case? Because I would have yeah. thought that people moving around the market would carry that knowledge much more frequently than people meeting in dark rooms and staying in the old employer. Yeah, it's a slightly different issue probably there because what you wouldn't have is a sort of meeting of minds in a way that's intended to be an anti-competitive arrangement. If anything, you'd probably have a breach of confidence by the employee who'd moved firms and is under a duty not to disclose confidential information from his previous employer and then does so. There has been a case, actually, funny enough, in America where the US um, uh, Department of Justice got very concerned about the... Uh, the, the employment promiscuity of people working in Silicon Valley who seem to just sort of hop around all the big tech companies uh, in a way that they were worried was, you know, in effect, um, being organized. I think that what had happened was a lot of the big tech companies, you know, got into sort of no-poaching type agreements with their competitors because there's such a lot of this going on. And there was a risk then of there being collusion between them um, as to you know, the terms on which they dealt with employees who were moving. So th th you could get into it, but the more likely thing is that would be a breach of confidence issue rather than a, an anti-competition issue. Um, there's a very important distinction in competition law between um, object and effect type agreements. Object ones are ones that are intended to restrict competition. They're just presumptively bad. Um, 
effect type arrangements would be things which fall short of, you know, cartel, hardcore cartel activities, they call it, but pure information exchange. That would be more the sort of stuff we would be talking about for your working groups. You know, people don't have bad intentions. On the contrary, they're probably trying to do uh, good things. Um, but there is a risk of, if things are not handled properly and information is not handled in the right way, things being exchanged which could have the effect of reducing competition. And the T-Mobile case I mentioned actually is quite an important one because that's authority for the proposition that if information is passed to you, um, it will be presumed against you by the regulators and the courts that you have taken it into account in then setting your own commercial conduct as long as you're just still active on the market. So you can rebut that presumption, but that's not a great place to be if you've received information that you ought not to have received it will be presumed you've acted upon it, and therefore it's had an impact so as to infringe competition law. Now, Martin alluded earlier to um, the possibility of effectively weighing up pro- and anti-competitive implications of information exchanges or agreements, uh, and that is something which is written into the law. Um, so it is possible to say, well, look, that information may have some sort of distorting, restrictive effect on competition, but we're doing it for really good reasons. So in the case we mentioned earlier, Martin, you know more about it than me, but I think the point was that exchanging information on the terms on which replacement hire cars would be provided to people who've been involved in an accident between the insurers was that it was going to reduce litigation. Uh, it was actually going to improve the service to insured parties and have various other beneficial effects that were deemed in the end to outweigh, at least at that point when it was assessed, and then indeed pos positively agreeing on those prices. Yeah. Right. So it was essentially a, a very rare case of um, legitimate price fixing. Yes. Um, and those are collector's items. Um, but you, you know, the point is it's quite hard to do this. It's not a very comfortable place to be, having a competition authority breathing down your neck saying, we think this restricts competition, over to you to justify it. There are relatively few cases where parties have successfully managed to do that. But it is possible. And I think in the industries in which a number of you are active, those are industries where people have successfully done it, but that's always a process you want to, frankly, go through in a considered way um, with advice rather than having to do it on the hoof because you find yourselves being investigated because people haven't had the thought process ahead of time. Question? Sorry, I was quite interested in the car. car one. Is the consumer always king? Because obviously that's not, if I'm a car hire company, I wouldn't be quite so happy about that behaviour. Mm. So it's anti-competitive for me as an industry, but it's good for the consumer. So how, how do you balance that? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And just for the purpose of the video, the, the question is how you balance the interests of competitors versus consumers. Um, this is the sort of thing that theoretical competition lawyers debate. And, and actually, the, the, the point you raise is a really good one, because <laughs> in that case, I think I'm right saying the ABI challenged that decision before the courts here, precisely because they were unhappy about it. Um, now, in the end, um, normally, the focus should be on consumers and whether the behavior has the effect of increasing the prices they pay as opposed to lowering the prices they pay. Often, though, competition authorities will take as a proxy protecting the competitive structure, preserving a competitive market you know, at, the, at the level above that on the basis that if you get that right, it ought to sort of translate into better service, lower prices, and so on to consumers. But it's not always obvious. You do get cases where there seems to be perhaps a conflict between what's at least the short-term interests of competitors versus the interests of consumers. Or indeed, I guess, between the short-term interests of consumers and the long-term interests of consumers. So you can think about it in that example, yes, it's clearly in the short-term interest of consumers that their car hire prices are at a certain level, and that has a good impact on premiums. I'll tell you what, in the long term, how does that work out? The insurers are effectively setting that price with one another. That really makes it difficult to be an effective car hire operator. Is that good for consumers in the long term? Might well not be. That's why it was a, it was a genuinely tricky decision for the OFT. It got appealed. The UFT eventually decided it wasn't going to spend any more time on it. Uh, and it is up for grabs again 12 years later. It's a genuinely difficult one to work out where the long-term and short-term interests, even of consumers, lie sometimes, which, uh, which I think goes to just where Mark started. Sometimes, um, from, from our starting point, when you're entering into a, uh, a new working group, it's not completely obvious whether problems will come up. 
but it's a question, I guess, of just thinking to yourself, might something happen here and being alert to it? Yeah. Um, here's an example, and we'll start to move into some case studies, but um, Martin, this was actually sort of based on something you saw in the press just the other day. The reason I decided to, to put this on its own slide is because, yes, this actually happened in the press this week in an industry that is, is close to a lot of us. Uh, there was a, a pretty clear statement by one of the major UK insurers, by somebody senior, that, quote, uh, premiums are currently unsustainably low in motor insurance and will have to rise by 5% next year. Now, I've made up the 5% figure, but that's not communicated to competitors in a smoke-filled room or even uh, in the context of a working group, a small group of people. That's communicated to the public. But you can kind of see why competition authorities find that rather troublesome. You're using the public uh, or using newspapers, the press, as a mechanism for softening competition going forwards. What's the risk that they're worried about? Well, your competitors at that point know that, yeah, raising their prices by 5% is probably going to be okay as well. There's not going to be a price war if they do that. So this this has become known as, as price signaling. And we, we thought we should probably raise it, A, because it seems to be prevalent in insurance at the moment, and also because you could see, at least in theory, in the, the publications that come out of your working groups, uh, in stuff that goes on the website, in, uh, in other forums in which you are a public voice, uh, that signalling is a risk that you should be aware of. It's quite tempting to say, look, it seems to us that uh, that premiums are not adequately covering risk at the moment. We think they're going to have to rise significantly in the next year. And that does contain a risk, I think, of being found to be price signalling. Excuse me, um, what on earth is wrong with that? I mean, that comment came from a chief executive to me. Yep. That seems perfectly fair and understandable. I mean, are we looking for ways to regulate us and legislate us into... Um, obscurity here, or, or, or is this just not taking common sense out of, of the whole, uh, so, whole argument? So, I think if I, uh, as a, an objective bystander who happens to have delved into what premium rates are in motor insurance over the past several years, uh, it's probably right. Motor insurance premium rates are going to rise in the next few years. That's correct. The problem is that putting out that sort of relatively specific information takes away your ability or makes it less likely that uh, one motor insurer will undercut another. Or the, the idea that there's a bit of uncertainty about how far they can push it. So if Ben Bernanke says that, in my mind, interest rates are going to rise over the next few years, is that criminal? Well, he's, I mean, don't forget, he's the, he's he's the regulator, so <laughs> he's not. He can do what he wants. So was the Portuguese Institute of Chartered Accountants. Yeah, but they're, they're acting in a different capacity there because they were acting as a representative body for their members who are competing against each other. So it, a lot of it here boils down to intention. Competition authorities get nervous if they think the intention behind making those statements is not to merely comment on the state of the market, but to actually try to induce competitors to play ball and behave in a way that will not lead to a price war or other disruptive competitive behavior. And so there have been cases where these sorts of statements have been looked at very, very closely because they worry that people are trying to mute competition with their rivals. And so, yes, there may be cases where this stuff, and it happens quite often, um, where this stuff is the right side of the line because it's people legitimately answering questions put by the press or put in a, a results press conference to them. Uh, and they're just commenting on the market as they see it. But there is a risk, and you know, you'll, you'll find in most big companies that people who are talking regularly to the media ought to be getting training on not falling into the trap of doing things that could be seen as signaling price rises to, um, to competitors. The biggest risk, I should say, is for companies who become known as the price leaders or the price setters in their industry, and they get a reputation for, tell you what, their chief executive will probably say something and then we'll know whether that's something we can follow or not. That's exactly what happened in the bananas industry in the 80s. Uh, it happened in the paper industry, I think, in the 90s, where companies went just through a regular process each quarter. In, in bananas, it was every week. In the paper industry, every quarter, 
just putting out little statements to let everybody know what was going to happen next. And that's where the competition authorities got concerned. Not, not for perhaps a one-off statement like that, mm. but something that became a, it's the a regular practice. I follow my leader pricing, as they, as they call it. If Alison so. Baker says Gareth Bale is not worth £100 million, pounds, is that mm. not exactly the same thing, trying to put Real Madrid and maybe other buyers off making purchase at the detriment of Tottenham Hotspur? Mm. What's the difference? Well, I mean, the difference is, you know, he's not... Well, it's a different situation, isn't it? Because he's not there, you know, he's not talking about season ticket prices. If, if Arsene Wenger stands up and says, you know, I think season ticket prices are going to have to go up next season by 10% because it's getting too cheap, then that would be an analogy. I think here, if you're talking about the value of a player and he's conducting the negotiation. It's an open market. Gareth Bell is a commodity. I mean, I find this actually taking part of a crazy experience. OK, well, I mean, you know, ultimately, you know, this is the approach the competition authorities take. And so, um, you know, it's best to be aware of it, that those sorts of statements do cause some concern. And there are cases where they've looked at those um, very closely. Here's another question. Yeah, I think, um, I'm, I'm just staying with the same theme, but um, where the price that we're talking about is one that would be public knowledge when the price goes up, and all you're doing is giving the information sooner. I'm, I'm struggling a bit, um, particularly if, it, if we're talking about a market. I mean, in insurance, prices go up and down all the time. Mm -hmm. So when a motor insurer puts their prices up, it's very obvious. I mean, so it's available on confused.com and yep. all the other things like that. Yep. They might come back down again later. So signaling where, signaling where you go before you go, if somebody else comes in and puts that puts their price up ahead of you, that actually leaves you cheaper. So there are, it's not as if you're not expecting people to, to put their prices up before you do if you're a market leader. And when your prices do go up when you're the market leader, everybody else knows, so they can go up as well. So I'm just wondering, have you, you, you didn't cite a case here, and in, in, as the discussion went backwards and forwards, I don't think you mentioned a case where something like this has um, been held culpable. And I'm just wondering whether you've taken something and, and pushed it to an extreme so, based on other cases where some of these factors that are surprising people weren't present. Right? Just to, to pick up two useful cases then. Bananas is a case. Uh, there has been a, uh, actually still going on, yeah. uh, bananas cartel case. And one of the key elements of that was that the price leader would signal to the market every week what the price was going to be. That was a pure price signaling case, though with other elements. The other point, that, or the other case that's maybe worth mentioning, because it is precisely about forward-looking premium information, is the uh, what's known as the what-if case, uh, where motor insurers a couple of years ago were feeding their uh, forward-looking premium information into a database operated by Experian. Uh, and that was then circulated by Experian to all the members for a fee. Uh, and they had access to what each insurer was going to price a certain set of at least representative risks at, uh, at some, I think, a month or so in advance of the prices moving. And that was uh, instantly on the OFT's radar. The Nine insurance firms who were involved and Experian eventually agreed to remove the forward-looking information. But it was precisely because it was forward-looking that the competition authorities had real concerns about it because it is more likely then to affect the commercial behaviour of other people in setting their prices. Does that...? Well, I think actually, I, 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 don't, I don't want to go on much longer because it's holding you up, but I think you've, you've introduced in both of those cases factors that would distinguish both cases from the, the one-off statement here, uh, uh, which, is, which is vague in terms of timing. Yeah, I, mean, and, I think it's important right. to say that on signalling cases, they are contentious. Okay? And what we're saying to you is not that every such statement as that would be found in the end to infringe competition on people would be fined and all the rest of it. But they are looked at very closely by regulators because it does raise in their mind a concern as to whether it may be part of a, a pattern of conduct in that market that would be consistent with people trying to influence their competitors 
uh, into follow by leader pricing. And so you get in these cases, competent authorities spending quite a lot of time and money uh, working with economists analyzing pricing patterns. So they would look at what happens to prices after these announcements are made and see whether they seem to see competitors falling into line in a way that they would not expect to see absent the announcements. So there are cases where that's been, you know, you mentioned paper, the wood pulp case yep. classically uh, a number of years ago was a, a very famous worldwide uh, cartel uh, where that was precisely the issue. Now, when we get so sort of beyond signaling and just talk about information exchanges generally of future information, that is really common or garden stuff for competition authorities. The information they're most concerned about being exchanged is forward-looking stuff which can impact on prices. And you know, the cases there are you know, sort of legion because that is you know, everyday sort of stuff for them. But we'll come on and say a bit more about that if we may because you know, we were conscious we need to give you some guidance on what categories of information are most sensitive. Can I just ask a quick question about the different players in this one and hmm. who's held responsible for what? So there's a direct like presumably of an insurance company who said something about prices. And then there's an organisation like the Institute of Factory Factories who mm -hmm. might have organised a conference that they wouldn't say that or might have reported that he said that in a journal or magazine or something. Mm -hmm. To my mind, there's something very different about being the director bloke that says something um, being the organisation that facilitates that community. Yeah, I mean, this particular statement was in a newspaper, so it was an interview. Um, now, is the newspaper in trouble for reporting the comment? Almost certainly not. And the same would apply to the institute and faculty, uh, unless somehow that was all part of the scheme, that actually the, the, the you know, way in which these things were done, knowingly by people, was to use that... Um, that uh, conduit as a way of disseminating the information to the market. And there's certainly been cases where you know, that's been the case, and some sort of trade association, for example, has been used as the uh, means by which the information has been put out there to all the people who are then expected to uh, modify their competitive behavior accordingly. Does that help? And sorry, question at the back. Um, and then I was thinking about, we had the gender neutral stuff come in towards the end of last year. There was a lot of talk in the media and by insurers as to the impact on premiums from that. You know, there was heaps of talk about premiums are likely to rise by 10 to 15%. Yeah. And that was very prevalent in the market. So was there no interest in that if the companies could justify <laughs> you know, the increase in premiums by the change in assumptions? Is that yeah, I mean, in relation to the first question, um, I think if... You know, if there had been no percentage given as being the indicative price rise that was expected, it's obviously a notch less bad. And so that would lessen the concerns somewhat. Would it remove the concerns? It would all depend on the context. And I think context is then key to your second question. I suspect that was just such a sort of industry-wide phenomenon that, frankly, everyone was commenting on it. Um, and there's nothing particularly surprising about the statements that are being made, nor probably any sort of pattern to it that would suggest that you've got you know, the sort of intentional follow a leader pricing, uh, which is the sort of thing that competition authorities object to. You know, they object to you know, one party typically trying to get everyone else in the industry to fall into line with what they want to happen. So removal of the dishonesty requirement is not the same as removal of an intent to, to possibly commit land to yeah, there's two things to keep apart here. The, the, the dishonesty removal applies only to criminal offence. So that is what can befall individuals who engage in this stuff. In terms of the infringements that can be committed by associations or companies, um, that is just a question of um, object, was it intended to restrict competition, or effect, will it have the result of doing it? With, you know, frankly, both of those hurdles being very easily satisfied. So even if you don't intend to do it, the result is that Correct, correct. Yeah, if it's just merely capable of having an effect, uh, and the, you know, as we say, that will be frequently presumed if you've you know, just received information that you can't but have taken account of in some way in setting your own prices and commercial terms, um, then you know, that bit of the infringement, if you like, will be made out. Well, it's pretty you know, the, the, it, there is certainly a, a large scope for application of these um, uh, prohibitions and for breach of them. Now, 
in the real world, the competition authorities can't and don't take every case. They have to prioritize. Uh, and so they tend to go on streaks. So, you know, right now there's a lot of stuff looking at, you know, reference rates in financial services because post-LIBOR, that's flavor of the month. You know, they, they get streaky like that and they get interested in a particular issue and then they try and root it out in different areas of the economy. Um, but they do have to prioritize. And so, frankly, a lot of stuff does happen that they could latch onto and they could investigate, but it's a question of resources and priorities and they don't. Um, but obviously there's, you know, a question of being aware of the risk around it so you're not taking a chance um, if those sorts of statements are made that they could you know, pick up on. Please. Professor Green, a consultant, had done a survey and reported that 80% of the people thought premiums were going to rise by more than 5% and they reported that. Was that equally likely to be an infringement, do you think? Because those sort of surveys are very common. Probably not. Probably not. I mean, we'll come on to how best to be involved in, say, benchmarking surveys later on. Mm. Um, benchmarking surveys that go to issues like, that, that are fundamentally price-related, like premium, are more risky than, than benchmarking surveys that go to cost components, like how many people do you have in your organization. So it's, I wouldn't say it's completely without risk, but you're down the scale there by some, some distance. What? Why are you down the scale? Because you have got a third person collecting the data, and working out what's the how to use it, uh, who's not related to the industry, so there's no collusion around that person as such. Second, um, let's assume that there is a good purpose for him doing that, that uh, there isn't that it's not anti-competitive in its intention, that he's done it for a good reason to help you understand better what's going on in a certain area of, of risk and what the consequences of that are. Uh, so I think those two factors, for me, point to that probably being significantly less risky. Okay. Um, well, let's uh, start talking about some case studies. I mean, this is good. I think it's great to get these examples out. It's the best way of conveying a lot to it. So do please carry on um, doing that. Uh, but we had some more thoughts that might just stimulate a bit more discussion along similar lines. Um, Martin. Shall I take, uh, take these then? So the, the first case study that we have envisaged is a working party, for example, to consider development of life insurance premiums uh, in light of emerging risks. And let's take the scenario where the group decides to recommend premium increases, not necessarily of any specific quantum, uh, on the basis that they think that current premiums are not adequately reflecting the development of morbidity or mortality risks. Now, what's What's the risk quota there? What are the risk things that would make that more or less risky? Well, it seems to us that, look, you're talking about something that's fundamentally price-related in premia. It seems to me to uh, involve a clear uh, attempt to agree, even if it is merely recommended. So it is not just sharing information. It's positively agreeing on a recommended course of action. Um, there is a signaling risk, of course, I suppose, even if it wasn't recommended. And you are really in an area that becomes quite problematic as a result. You are positively recommending price increases uh, um, through a group of competing organizations. From our side, that would seem to us to be a relatively high-risk course of action. And if a, a working party comes up with a piece of research and the piece of research says um, mankind is just going to live another 10 years or something, mm -hmm. it has an immediate effect on annuity rates and life insurance rates. So you're not sort of explicitly saying you're going to have to raise your, your, your premiums there and reduce them there. I think that's a really important That's point. the crucial that, difference. Yes. That's so the crucial Giving people point. The, what they need to make up their own minds about what you do about premium, that's definitely on the right side of the line. Then moving that bit further to say, there, therefore, we recommend that the industry should raise premiums, I, I think does shade in something that's genuinely problematic. Or worse yet, by a certain amount. Even if it states the obvious. You just don't say, we recommend you push up. I, I really would not. Mm. I really would not. Mm. If you say simply, this is likely to lead this. to insurance companies increasing their rates, is that... The further you go down that line, the more risk you import into what you're doing. Uh, you know, fundamentally, the distinction competition is, is drawing here is that 
activities which increase the dissemination of information to the market, which enable all actors in the market to improve their decision making in independently and unilaterally determining the competitive consequences for them is the right side of the line. Matters uh, or approaches which seek to align competitive behavior by suggesting a particular response, whether that's on pricing or any other parameters of competition, are the wrong side of the line because that is restricting competition rather than just enhancing information so as to promote it. And you know, that at root is the principle that a competition authority would bring to bear on these sorts of uh, exchanges. Ben. Very, very interesting. Is, is, is context quite significant here in the mm. sense that we're a professional body of producing all sorts of material, policy based material, quite academic material at times, academic discussion type material, yeah. which might contemplate from a policy point of view different scenarios, including price increases as a result of particular developments in the market, whatever. Mm -hmm. And depending, and that might be a question legitimate in the context of a sort of policy academic type discussion, mm. presumably depending how it was conveyed to some extent. Or, or are you, as the second, you're approaching?